was coerced into giving a, sm a shorter talk <laughs> on the way here. <laughs> so so I'll, co I'll try to co uh, cooperate. <laughs> we'll see. So anyway, uh, um, since uh, the flavor of the talk will be a little different from uh, the other talks that you listen to, I, I guess I'll just give some some introductory or survey kind of a introduction at the beginning, and then and then I'll use my slides to uh, for the more technical part. Um, so, uh, well, you have you heard several talks actually during this workshop about irregularity, Castellum of regularity, and its bounds and conjectures and some <coughs> recent results. And my interest is in actually, um, it, it's related, but it's a little different. It's, a, it's actually about a um, non-commutative uh, case. Um, but a simple way of actually, I guess, uh, understanding the regularity is, of course, you know, by using this free resolution, right? So we, if once we have a free resolution of a given ideal or module, um, and then <coughs> by to keeping track of uh, the generators at, at the CCS, uh, and, it's, and by look, keeping track of the degrees, we can compute the uh, regularity. Um, problem with this is uh, when it's non-commutative, then, then we do not necessarily have a finite free resolution. So quite often, uh, we end up with actually uh, infinite projective dimension. And, and, so, uh, often, and sometimes we actually end up with, um, uh, what is it, um, infinite regularity. So uh, the uh, the question arose here. Am I uh, here that um, okay? So s let's say we have seemingly two different um, objects, like uh, um, ideal reg uh, or or models, <coughs> and over non uh, in in, in a non commutative setup. And say uh, by certain by our instinct or by our experience, we can kind of. Uh, tell that one is more complicated than the other, but both have, let's say, infinite regularity. So, I mean, uh, so in this case, you know, regularity doesn't give us any information regarding, I in terms of uh, the complexity of the object. Often we use, uh, the regularity gives us some insights about the complexity, but in this case, it, it, it often it, it doesn't in the non commutative case. So can we actually find a notion so that we have a, a, some sensible concept of a you know, regular uh, or refined notion of regularity. I mean, that that's the motivation here. So, uh, um, so to do that, we we should we'll, we will first uh, we'll have to come up with a way of computing free resolution for non-commutative algebras and also their representations. Um, here, my, I, my motivation again is to to be able to compare different representations, and and even when the uh, we have an infinite free resolution, we want to be able to uh, have some, some defined concept of regularity. So, uh, um, so we're going to have to uh, develop some, te uh, some ways of computing free resolutions, even when it's infinite. And, and um, so how do we do this? Uh, so, we'll, so I'll first uh, just briefly review the commutative case, what people do in the commutative case. And, and see, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll try to understand what can be extended, what cannot be extended to the non committed So in the commutative case, so I guess, so in that sense, this can be called algebraic computation, in the sense that we actually want to be able to compute free resolution, compute regularity, um, and a lot of other things. Um, so here, uh, I guess, we have a, uh, Variety. I'll just consider affine case for now, for a moment. Um, let's say, and we have a, a what was my notation? Was it V? F. We want to be able to do, we want to be able to manipulate these guys. We are all familiar with this. And people have been working to, uh, to manipulate these guys with computers. And why 
a lot of uh, quite a lot of work have been done, of course. Uh, I mean, you now you all, many of you probably are familiar with Macaulay too and Singular and all those things. I mean, uh, which actually uh, uh, efforts to in this direction. So, uh, so algebraically, <laughs> we are looking at uh, ideal. Uh, well, I'm dealing with the affine case for now. And module of finally generated. And so we, now we, we like to deal with this, we, we like to do computations with this. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So in the commuted case, I guess the main idea has been. form I to a monomial ideal. This was, and this is what we're going to do in the non-commutative case too. So we, um, the point of trying to get a monomial, uh, monomial ideal out of a given ideal is that this is very simple thing, simple object, simple combinatorial. So many things can be easily uh, read off on this, right? Um, you know, uh, well, I mean, I'm sure that you all know this. For example, if I have, let's say, <coughs> uh, this kind of ideal, again, this is f point, um, then Then uh, what is it? Uh, X. So for example, uh, in general, Hilbert function computation Hilbert function is not that straightforward. But in this case, it is, right? I mean, uh, we can simply read off the information here. Um, so here, for example, um, let's say the Hilbert function of this, which is this. vector space dimension. In this case, I guess this is just can be read, read off. And I say 0, it's 1. And then 3, uh, what is it, 6, 8, 10. Uh, it goes like that. So this this guy will be 2s plus, hang on, 2. So from here, it kind of becomes regular. Uh, it starts its regular behavior. And of course, this, this number itself, also can be understood in terms of regularity. Um, so here, um, the reason that this is so easy to compute is because we have this monomial structure. So point is, uh, if we can get a monomial ideal out of the given ideal while preserving many algebraic properties, then, then we are in good shape, right? I and mean, that's the whole idea of this algebraic computation. So here, uh, We basically, for a given ideal, we, we want to associate a, some kind of monomial ideal. So this is my monomial ideal, whatever it is. And um, see, um, and this association is not unique, of course. We want to, and and this this guy, this process actually uh, can be considered as a flat deformation. It's actually you can actually construct a flat family. Which is a uh, isomorphic for S of A for every teaser uh, real number, and and somehow the limit as t goes to zero, that goes to that becomes this. So so this is a flat family, meaning that uh, Hilbert function, for example, is preserved. So that and with this we can easily compute Hilbert function in this way. 
and which actually gives us a way of computing Hilbert function in general, right? I mean, uh, so, I mean, and we can actually do this for many invariants, which are preserved uh, their uh, flat family. In, and well, even those those things that are not preserved can be uh, still uh, even uh, lifted from from this if we actually keep track of uh, additional information. So that's the whole idea of doing computation. I mean, com so all the computation becomes just si just simple, very simple combinatorial computation once we get to it. Um, so here, so what is this association? What is this guy? And again, it's important to understand that because we want to be able to now do similar things in a non-commutative case, in which case actually it's more complicated, so we need to be, we need to kind of understand this very carefully. Um, so this guy, monomial order, or term order, I won't write the definition, I, I expect that most people know this. It's just a total ordering, linear ordering on the set of monomials, right, in the polynomial ring, with, with, uh, which is multiplicative, okay? So, uh, well, total ordering on the monomials, on the set of monomials. Monomial ring such that it says uh, it said uh, every monomial is greater uh, so one is the one is the small in, in this total ordering it's a linear ordering it's a total ordering so uh, we are just uh, trying uh, in in when very this is just monomial for every monomial uh, um, and second when I, whenever I have whenever one monomial is bigger than the other monomial, and if I, it should be product, uh, multiplicative, meaning that if I multiply common, if I multiply common monomial to both sides, the, the inequality is, pre uh, the order is preserved for every monomial. So uh, such, such a linear ordering is called uh, monomial order. And then what we do is, uh, we, now we, we, we are, for a given idea, now we can like to define that association, of, uh, which is assigned to or associated to the given ideal. So, for any uh, given ideal of of my polynomial ring, well, I'll just use this notation for now. Um, we define this guy, which is a monomial ideal generated by reading term of all the polynomials in I. So this is, right now, this has infinitely many generators because of the idea of I probably have infinitely many polynomials and we are just taking leading terms. Here, leading to, to be able to take a leading term, of course, we need monomial uh, order. So polynomial has many, many terms. And of those many terms, we can compare the terms now because of the given monomial order. So this is always, with respect to a given fixed term order, right? that's of course always given. Uh, with respect to a given fixed term order, F, I can, I can compare these uh, terms and see which one is the leading term because it's a linear term, linear order. We, I can always dis, uh, decide which one is the highest uh, term and that is the leading term, which is a monomial. And then, this is an ideal, monomial ideal generated by those infinitely many monomials. Yeah. Uh, can you give us uh, an example of a total ordering which is a monomial order? Lexicographic. Or degreed. Or graded. Lexicographic order. Uh, or reverse. When I say graded, it, it sometimes some people just say degree, degree lex order, lexicographic order. Um, so, for example, in, in the variable two case, I, I can just simply explain this way, I guess. <coughs> what it is is uh, this is a variable two variable case. So this this is a uh, one y y square 
x, x, y, like, like that. I'm just looking at the exponent vectors. So, and then uh, Lex graphic term order with, let's say, x bigger than y would be uh, 1, y, y squared. So it goes this way. And anything here, it, so 1, so it's like 1, y, y squared, like that. And then x is bigger than any of these terms. That's Lex graphic. It's dictionary order. Dictionary order. And then x, x, y, like that, right? And so it goes this way, this way. So this way we can just uh, try to write down infinitely many monomials in, in linear way. <laughs> and this is a less graphic order. It just satisfies all those conditions. Um, if, you, if you are working with uh, projections or, or illumination, Elimin in illumination theory, people use less graphic term order. Um, when you, for example, let's say, when you have a parametrized variety, um, when you have a parametrized variety, let's say parametric curve. When you have a parametric curve like this, let's say polynomial parametrization. If you have a parametric curve like this, so let's say that's like this, and then uh, this is a polynomial par par parametrized curve. Uh, and when these are polynomials, in, and let's say uh, you want to define the def uh, define the equation of this curve, and and typically this this can be easily uh, uh, easily done by using less graphic term order. People use elimination theory. So uh, there, this is very popular. Graded Lex order is a total degree degree always comes first, meaning that this one x one y x y square, x, y, y, x square. So it goes this way, this way. So uh, so you look at the total degree first. Total degree is bigger. That's always bigger. And when the total degree is same, you just do the tie-breaking with the uh, left graphic term order. So that's the gradient lex order, or degree lex order. Reverse degraded lex order is slightly more complicated, but similar. But the uh, thing is, uh, like I said, this is used often in geometry computation. Um, this is used most often for many computations because uh, typically it's known that uh, this term order, the computations are usually fast fast with this, this term order. I mean, many computations depend on the term order that you use. Some term orders make the computation faster. This one is usually fast. <coughs> okay, so... Uh, if a term order, uh, yeah, no, no, it's not. I mean, there are, if, there are many term orders, of course, infinitely many. Even you can use a weighted term order, meaning that one variable, you can put more weighting on one, one variable. And you can, use, so that, that's called weighted term order. You can use matrix term order even, um, meaning that you can, let's say, you can have some, uh, uh, some matrix uh, with, uh, with non-zero non uh, determinant, of course, numbers, let's say, uh, Two by two matrix, or let's say SL two matrix, to determine one, and then what it is is uh, you do the multiplication, and then compare. Uh, so th this gives actually a way of uh, mixing up the variables and 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 compare. So this is called matrix order. Okay. So there are many different term orders. These are infinitely many. Thing is strangely indeed. So if you, oh by the way, right now this has infinitely many generators, but. Uh, of course, you know that there's a finite subset which still generates the whole thing, right? Uh, this is, well, basically, I mean, this is basically uh, the Weatherian condition, but there is actually simpler uh, or combinatorial proof called Dixon's lemma, but um, basically, you can always find the finitely many monomials which generate this, okay? So this is actually always generated by finitely many monomials. And the thing is, uh, Okay, we're not going to get to the second part, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you told me, right? Okay, uh, thing is, uh, this guy, so if I change my term order, that thing changes, right? That's what I, when I said, we, are, we want to associate a monomial order to a given ideal, monomial ideal to a given ideal, but if I change the term order, I will get different monomial ideals. 
but they all have these nice properties that, that there is a flat family and say they have the same, uh, for example, uh, same um, uh, Hilbert function or among other things. But these are not unique, but if you fix a tumor, then this is unique. Okay? And another thing is, uh, turns out that for a given ideal, there are infinitely many tumors. However, there are only finitely many basically initial ideals. So many of, many of, the, the, many of these different tumors actually produce the same uh, initial ideal. So this, this property is studied by s several people, uh, and it's called universal Grabner basis, actually. Um, so for example, uh, this book, Bernd Stumpfel's book, uh, Grabner basis and polytopes, deals, uh, studies uh, what are possible, I mean, uh, the relations between these different uh, initial ideals. So when we change the term orders, same ideal produces different term orders. What are the relations? So that's another subject. Um, OK. Now, in general, uh, obviously you see that if I is, uh, well, this is a commutative case, so, so we have a Noetherian condition here. Again, the problem is when we go to non-commutative non case, we lose the Noetherian condition and things become messy. I mean, uh, we do not necessarily have finitely made generators, I mean, things like that. Suppose I have this. We are tempted to think, what if I just take, when I say, I will just, initial term of this, which is the same as leading term, leading term or initial term. Once we have a, always when I say this, always I mean I fix one term order, because without that, you know, given term order, this, that one, this, these things won't make sense. So initial term of this, In general, it will be this, okay? O apparently, right? Because these guys are obviously in here. However, uh, you might be able to combine these guys in a strange way to cancel all the leading terms, and maybe it may produce a new leading term, which is not, you know, a multiple of any of this, right? So apparently. If equality holds, sometimes, see, this is the genius of uh, he actually uh, somehow saw this. If sometimes, if we, could, if we find these hypersurfaces well, okay, if we find these hypersur nice hypersurfaces, then some, somehow then equality can hold. What that means is uh, whatever the combination, linear combination you make out of this, the cancellation may occur among the linear, you know, leading terms and stuff. Whatever cancellation occurred, the new, the resulting thing, the new leading term will be still. Not, not new, I mean, just still, uh, you know, multiple of one of these. That's what this means, right? So such nice hypersurfaces may, can exist, okay? So that's, so, uh, so you don't have to name it uh, a standard, standard basis, nice generators. And he used this uh, when he uh, studied uh, resolution of singularity, the, these ni nice hypersurfaces. So when equal if equality holds, then, then in that case, this guy, this set, this, this, this generating set, <coughs> is called, it, it has a special name. Well, like I said, we're not going to call this standard basis, but that name is not, not u often used nowadays. It's now called Grebner basis. He's now an Austrian. He's, he's, he's not a German, he's an Austrian. <laughs> okay. uh, but but Grebner has nothing to do with actually this work. It was, uh, it was done by his student, Buchberger, but somehow he named it as after his, his advisor. Now, <coughs> so, so a grammar basis of given ideal is a particularly nice generator, gener as set of generators with this property, okay? So uh, like I said, once you have those nice generators, then Tehunaka figured out that he can actually, uh, he can study he can study singularity in an easier way. So that was his insight. So what he did in his paper was um, he actually showed the, that for any given ideal, there always, you can always find a nice new, new generating set satisfying this property. 
So uh, he, he, pr he proved the existence of a standard basis. Although he, he didn't show, he didn't, he has no, he had no interest in actually how, to, in, in actually computing this guy. He actually just showed the existence of this. So that's why people do not call this Runaka basis. <laughs> because he didn't pursue this computational aspect. Uh, this, uh, that computational aspect is, uh, was studied or well, pursued by Buchberger. So, um, so now, the second Castel Lugo number. As I announced earlier, uh, my interest is actually in studying or extending this, generalizing this to non commutative case. Non, not even non commutative algebras, but non commutative actually, uh, I mean, representations of non commutative algebras. <coughs> representations are tricky here because uh, to study representations, you have to deal with both algebra structure and module structure together. So you actually have to deal with uh, two, for example, defining ideals, not just one. Not one. one defining the algebra structure and one defining the module structure. So, uh, and those have to be somehow correlated or studied. So that makes uh, uh, the the what is it, computational free resolution of representations trickier. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so that's what I want to study. But again, in the committed case, you know, you already have heard uh, of many talks in this workshop. It provides a measure of complexity. And uh, I want to actually relate this to also computational complexity, meaning that, meaning that you, you know, the first uh, statement that I wrote on the board was, I want to study these, uh, these uh, geometric objects by computers, right? Manipul I want to be able to manipulate them by computers. But some objects are easy to manipulate, some are, some are hard. And I'm claiming that this Castillo one for regularity somehow gives us an ind indication of that computational complexity, how hard it is to manipulate. And that, and and I want because I want to also deal with uh, non-commutative objects. I, and in that case, actually, uh, this this is actually more important because uh, we need to actually know um, the how hard it is to manipulate those objects you know, uh, in you know, some systematic way. Okay. So, uh, so let's say. In the characteristic zero case, now consider uh, the homogeneous ideal of and here when I say homogeneous ideal, I want I I I'm talking about ideal I with with the given set of generators, okay? With respect to that given set of generators, I can talk about D of I, which is the maximum of uh, degrees of a minimal set of generators. Uh, generators. So with respect to given set of generators, I can talk about its uh, degree. So this is uh, one measure of complexity, right? I mean, uh, of course, this seems a little more complicated than this, right? I mean, that's roughly. So, uh, and of course, and I'm gonna try, I'm gonna fix my tomorrow here. Reverse Lexor. Reverse Lexor is actually um, similar to. Uh, uh, diverse degree lexor, right? Great, it's a graded order. Dealing with, uh, dealing with projective uh, uh, computation here. So, reverse uh, graded or, or degree graded. What, that, what it is is, uh, for example, the two variable case, what it is is um, For any two, any, for any monomials, I want to be, I need to, I want to be able to uh, co compare them, right? That's monomial order. And uh, reverse graded lex order is uh, what? First, you look at the total degree. Whatever, if the total degree is bigger, it's always bigger. And when the total degrees are same, we do, we need tie breaking, right? 
And then tie breaking is can be done lexicographically or reverse lexicographically. Reverse lexicographically mean lexicographically means uh, you look at this guy first, and if i is bigger than p, then we just simply conclude that we don't even go to the second one, right? That's dictionary, isn't it? If uh, we have uh, a b and uh, c a, if you compare this, then a is first in the dictionary, right? You don't even go to the second one. So that's dictionary order. That's graphic to work. And when these two are same, we go to the second one and compare. That's the, this is lex graphic term order. So this is graded lex order. Graded reverse lex order is, again, you do the tie break, uh, when we do the tie breaking, you go to the last first. It's reverse, last. And here, compare these two numbers. And if this is smaller, the smaller is bigger. So you do reverse twice, okay? That's reverse lex order. And somehow this is also a nice term order, and this is actually most frequently used. Now, okay, in this case, what uh, many people studied, like especially uh, Bayer and Stillman, got many results on this. One, uh, one result, one well-known result is regularity of I and regularity of initial <coughs> ideal of I. I said I and initial I, there's the, they are in the, you know, there is a flat family containing them, right? There's a flat deformation from here to here. But, and many uh, pro algebraic properties are preserved in a pr flat family, like, like Kelber function, degree, dimension, and all. But regularity is not preserved. It turns out that the theorem is regularity is an upper semi-continuous function. Meaning that it can only jump on some special fibers. But of course, when there's actually a flat family, and, and when t is non-zero, it's actually an uh, isomorphic family, right? So of course, there is a regularity the same. So regularity is the same, and, and only at this uh, special fiber, it jumps. So it takes with this. So uh, um, so this is upper semi continuity of regularity. And in generic coordinates, you avoid those special fibers. So in that case, of course, it turns out. So again, this guy is much more, much simpler than this. And we can actually still, we can do a lot of computations with it. That's the point. I mean, that was my point of a deforming, right, to a monomial idea. So this guy actually is still a very valuable tool. And, OK. Um, and if, if this guy is borrowed fixed, Borel fixed is a concept of, uh, for monomial ideals. There are some Borel fixed monomial ideals, meaning um, when you have a monomial ideal, so let's say, I'm just, let's say just two variables, x i, y, j, i1, j1, x i2, y, j2. Let's say just, I mean, you'll have some monomial uh, generators, right? I mean, uh, if you have a monomial ideal. And you can actually now uh, apply change of variables to x. But when you apply uh, low, low triangular change of variables, okay, meaning that so this this is uh, your new variable, and then you, you, such x becomes uh, you can rewrite the monomials in terms of uh, the new variables. Then you, of course, those are not monomials anymore. But and it, so if you do that, uh, but. Somehow, for any low, low triangular change of variables, let's say your monomial idea doesn't change. That's for first. Okay? So it's a very special ideal. And it turns out, Galigo's theorem says, for most, uh, uh, what is it? Um, for almost all change of variables, actually, uh, I mean, when you apply this change of variables for, I mean, so meaning that that's actually a, 
in the in the in the set of in the set of the uh, the matrices GL two. Um, those got, uh, there is an open set. Kalibas theorem says. So for most for almost all change of variables, actually uh, this ideal doesn't change. You initialize that doesn't change. So generically, generically, uh, this guy is more fixed. Generically. So anyway, um, and it is so it is in generic coordinates. That's what I mean. It is more fixed in generic coordinates because because of Kalibas theorem. In that case, now you combine these two results, then what you get is regularity of your ideal i is actually regularity of initial ideal of i, which is actually the same as degree of the maximum degree in, in this. If initial ideal is below fixed, then these two are the same. That's, that's, um, So the regularity is simply the degree of, 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 the, of the maximum degree polynomial in your generator set. I mean, so you, this is a monomial ideal, and you simply look at the maximum degree there, and that's your regularity. I mean, it, this is just surprisingly simple. I mean, regularity computation, you don't need field resolution here. You just read it off. So in this case, what you see is, uh, what is this? What is initial ideal? Initial ideal is, if you have a gradual basis, in that case, your initial ideal is the same as, it's simply generated by taking the leading terms of your gradual basis. So, what you, so once you have a gradual basis, with respect to reverse max order, you have an ideal. You have its uh, gradual basis. And in the gradual basis, simply take the leading terms. Right? Then those are monomials which generate this. That's a definition of gradual basis. And, those, if it's simply, and then just let's see which, which one has the highest degree. And that degree is simply uh, regularity. That's the, that's what this says. So, so regularity now is just uh, simple matter, just matter of simply just reading off the, the, the gradual basis. Okay. So this is the I guess fascinating interplay between um, this uh, gradual basis concept and and this regularity. You don't, you don't we don't get to free resolution. Okay. That degree means that uh, total degree. Total degree, yeah. yeah. Total degree, there are yeah. two total degree, the same, just that total Yeah, degree. yeah, that's right, yeah. So, oh, this is all result. This is just the 1987 or 88, Bayer's German. About 20 years old. Um, so, of course, here we need several conditions. We need characteristic zero condition. We need uh, uh, we have to use uh, this this particular term order, term order, and you need to make sure that you are using you know, you know, this is genetic, I mean genetic st like statement. And in general, how do we actually compute regularity? Uh, not like that. I mean, for a particular, for a special ideal, how do you actually compute regularity? Um, of course, we use free resolution. So, how do you compute free resolution? Well, people have worked on it, and we can now do it using gradual basis. Um, actually, this is a repeated application of a Schreier's theorem. Schreier, Schreier has this algorithm of computing CISIS. A linear CISIS. And uh, so, uh, so this can be done by repeated application of repeated application of Schreier uh, algorithm. This is a linear CISIS computation algorithm. And So here, uh, these guys are all free.
And once you have this uh, free resolution, and once you know, uh, so so these represent the, um, the what is it? The degrees of uh, of the of the cities and and at each level. And regularity is just a maximum of these guys. You just discount it. Oh, oops. Yeah. By I. So once, if you actually compute a free resolution, then of course you have this. Now in the non commutative case, this is what we're going to do. Okay, we, we will try to develop a way of computing free resolutions, and with that, we'll, compute, we'll define resolution. But unfortunately, the, tr the tricky part, as I said, is in the non commutative case, you have to expect that this free resolution, you know, you, you have to expect an infinite free resolution. Right? That's uh, troublesome. So that means actually, uh, of course, even though you have infinite free resolution, if the twisting is bounded above, then we're okay, right? I mean, that, that maximum will be still, the maximum still will give us regularity. But, I mean, I mean <coughs> twisting uh, discounted by i, the level, if, if that's bounded above, we're okay. Now, problem means the twisting may, may go up like crazy. Okay, in that case, of course, the regularity will be in the, so in, this can be infinite in the non, this can be, could be in the non commutative case. Sure. So is there a difference between uh, using the left resolution and the right resolution in the non commutative case? Um, no, it's actually a little bit, oh, no, you have to actually consider. Um, for an algebra, you have to consider uh, two-sided ideals. Ah. Yeah. Two-sided ideals. For representation, you have to consider uh, left modules over over uh, two-sided ideal. Uh, two, uh, no, no, over non-commutative algebra. So here, the idea is a two-sided idea, where yeah. the resolution is taking as a, right. is it a left uh, idea and a left module. So bi modules. I'm sorry. Bi modules. Bi module. Yeah. So R is considered as a bi module. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, one easy example, one simple example of this infinite uh, non custom level one for regularity is actually exterior algebra. Exterior algebra actually does have an infinite regularity. I mean, it has infinite projective dimension. It, it, it goes forever. Uh, hang on. Yeah, it, and it has an infinite regularity. Right. And there are examples when you have infinite free, uh, minimal free resolution while regularity is uh, fi finite. So it's so. How do we actually, in that case, is there any meaningful measure of complexity in that case, when the regularity is infinite? I mean, is there something that has uh, high, you know, uh, more complex behavior than, than others? Or not in the all that in the family of infinite uh, regularity? So um, our observation was, since well, we are approaching, so I will, I'm not so I'm not going to use our well maybe. I'll, I'm not going to use this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to scare you <laughs> by, by just studying this. Uh, yeah. um, our idea was when this guy goes forever, um, we, we trace the twistings. Uh, this, uh, well, discounted by the level. And if it goes forever, um, it, it can be infinite. And then what, it, what we did is, um, in that case, what's the growth of the, uh, of the twisting? We can actually, in that case, I think we, we, we decided to look at the growth instead of just the number itself. And, and different things with the infinite regularity often have different growth. Okay? So maybe that growth can be a meaningful measure. So we actually de uh, defined a new uh, generalized, so I'm just skipping a lot in between. Uh, I, I, I'm not telling you how to compute this free resolution for non commutative algebras and also representations, uh, how to deal with uh, this um, representations, I mean, uh, which is different from just uh, algebras, because we have to deal with actually a two module structure and algebra structure together. But anyway, so I'm, I'm going to just uh, pretend that we're all, we're, all, we're all done with that and general, generalized, generalized, custom Lubomon for regularity. In the non commutative case, we, dis we decided to define define 
define a pair for that. Um, let's say if it's an ideal weight, if it's a module, uh, the representation or whatever, uh, we decided to define a pair instead of, usually we have just regular, but now we have this. And what it is is uh, basically the twisting, twisting this uh, maximum degree. So let's say, I'll just look at it this way. This is the maximum degree, maximum twisting in, in, in the, at the i-th level, minus i. And our, what, what we wanted, what we wanted was that this thing maybe is growing, but we wanted to keep track of the growth of this guy, right? So it's not bounded. So usually this, the maximum of this is uh, in the final, in the commutative case, that that's regularity. But in the non-commutative case, we wanted this to be something like this. So I'll just use this. This guy times like this. If E is zero, we call that we call uh, we call this guy as exponent of growth and, and rate of growth. Okay. T i is a integer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a maximum degree of maximum twisting at each level. Yeah. Exponent of growth, and this is a, a what is it? A rate of growth. And we wanted these two uh, uh, integers to to be something like, to behave something like this. To behave like this. It's, this is not an integer. This is an integer. It, it, this is not, it's not. So what is e zero? When e is zero, uh, for example, when this uh, when your uh, free resolution is finite, for example, in that case, this is zero. Okay. In that case, this part is simply one. So your this guy will be just uh, so that means what? That's the usual regularity. So uh, when the, that's finite, then this thing is uh, asymptotically just r. Right. So so when. So, which means actually this thing coincides with uh, usual regularity when it's uh, when the usual regularity makes sense, and when the usual regularity doesn't make sense, it still gives us a, a, a meaningful measure of complexity. Okay, and and it can now catch the difference between two two different uh, infinite regularity uh, uh, representations, right? Uh, so. Uh, uh, usual, this is usual custom global uh, When so, so we have actually done some computations and uh, for example, uh, let's see. Um, and our examples are, um, uh, our examples are catch movie algebras. And there actually we have uh, computed, we have basically classified all different uh, regularities for different classes. And uh, typically, this is two in that case. So it, it, the twist indeed increases exponentially, not exponentially, but quadratically. No, hang on, hang on. No, no, I'm sorry. This is two. No, yeah, this is two. So actually, uh, in the in the case in the case of continuity algebra, the twisting usually increases quadratically, uh, which I think is a new 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 observation. And uh, and and then actually, like I said. Uh, gives us a, a new insight in, in, in understanding the, the complexity of these guys. Sorry that, uh, sorry about all that fuss, but yeah, I'll stop.